Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this last week, I was very briefly in my homeland, Minnesota, (laughs) as we dropped off our daughters, Cecilia and Claire, to spend a week with my parents, their grandparents. By the way, if you want something to talk about with Claire when she gets back, ask her about how she personally caught 42 fish with Paw Frank. (laughs) And a snapping turtle tried to get them too. It was very exciting. (laughs) Well, anyway, on a whim, as, as we got within 100 miles of home, I texted my best friend from high school. I was hoping that on the off chance he would happen to be home as well during the 12 hours that we would be. Now that was a very long shot, but as it turned out, he was. And so I got to spend the evening in a boat on the whitefish chain of lakes with him. Now these days, my high school best friend is a financial planner. I always enjoy talking to him about his job. He's clearly good at it, and he's perceptive as well. And believe it or not, one of the things we talked about on the boat that evening was financial security, (laughs) financial security. And my friend shared something that that he says to his clients on a regular basis, and and this is what he says. He says, financial security, well, that's not actually a number or a specific amount of money. Financial security, it's not a specific amount of money. It's a feeling, right? Security. That is, it, it varies from person to person, and situation to situation. Now, I admit, I had not thought about financial security in that way before, but, but my friend is on to something, isn't he? Some people, well, they feel financially secure with, with fairly limited resources. And others, well, they never feel financially secure, no matter how much they have. My friend, he's met them both in his work And my guess is that you and I have as well in our lives. We may tend towards one side of that extreme or the other even. Well, this morning, Jesus, he gets asked to intervene in a financial planning dispute of sorts between two brothers arguing over an inheritance. By the way, financial planners hate getting involved in things like this. And as Jesus tends to do, he goes in a different direction than anyone expects. First, in Luke chapter 12, he refuses to intervene, doesn't he? He says, man, who made me judge or arbitrator over you? Which is a pretty rich thing for Jesus to say, isn't it? (laughs) Anyway, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? Secondly, he asks this man and everyone else that's listening, to reconsider their priorities. And Jesus does that, as he often does, by by telling a parable, telling a story. And in Jesus' story, there is a wealthy man who's had a good harvest, a bumper crop, so to speak. In fact, the crop is so big that this this wealthy man, he doesn't have room to store it all. His, His silos, his storage facility is too small. And so he does what what anyone might do in his place. He decides he's going to build a bigger set of silos. I'll do this, he says. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. But Jesus says, this does not turn out well, does it? In fact, the very night the man makes this decision and says to himself, You have ample goods stored up for many years. You are financially secure. Eat, drink, be merry. That very night, he dies. His soul is required of him. Now, if you're like me, and of course you are, (laughs) there are lots of things that, that don't make for comfort in this story from Jesus. 
I mean, first and foremost, it, it looks like the rich man is doing something that, that we would do. In fact, something we are encouraged to do, save for the future. I mean, we don't have barns to build, but many of us have their modern equivalents. We have savings accounts and real estate and investments and retirement plans. At least we would like to have those things. We maybe even have a financial planner to work with, like my best friend from high school. And almost all of us, no, no matter how much opportunity we have or we don't have to store up wealth today, we would love to get to a place where all that is left to do is relax and eat and drink and be merry, like the rich man. But according to Jesus, here in Luke chapter 12, all that saving, all that planning, well, it may not be worth anything in the end. In fact, it might even be bad for us. It might even show us up to be fools, like the rich man with those silos in his head when he died. Now true, Jesus does tell us here that the issue is deeper than just this man's building project. It isn't even so much that, that this rich man thought of the future and, and prepared for it, that he saved up for it, or even precisely speaking that he was a rich. If you look at verse 21 here in Luke chapter 12, Jesus says this, he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God, is not rich toward God. We'll talk about this more in a bit. But before we do that, I do think we need to recognize that what Jesus is saying here in Luke 12 in this parable, well, it isn't one of his, his out there, his hyperbolic teachings, but actually something that we can see all over the place in Scripture. I mean, we heard a bit of it this morning from Ecclesiastes. And if anything, it's, it's more pessimistic about wealth and preparing for the future than Jesus. I mean, it says it's not just that laying up treasures for ourselves is foolish in Ecclesiastes. It's everything, everything we might do to find pleasure in life. The preacher says, then I considered all my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, it was vanity. It was striving after the wind. Friends, the preacher of Ecclesiastes, is, he's not just talking about a bad week at the office or at home or at school. He's talking about the good weeks too. Everything, vanity like trying to catch the wind. And Psalm 49 doesn't help. Remember verse 10? For we see that even the wise die, as well as the ignorant and foolish. They perish alike and leave their riches to others. So not exactly words of deep comfort this morning, as we strive to make a better life for ourselves and for our families and prepare for the future. Instead, we're hearing a warning, right? Don't think. Don't think for a moment that, that we can build metaphorical barns, bank accounts, and investment portfolios big enough to guarantee our happiness or deliver security or extend our life. For that matter, don't think we can ever be wealthy enough to buy our way out of the ultimate price, the ultimate end of life, which is death. But no man can deliver his brother nor pay unto God the price for him, says verse 7 of Psalm 49. Man, this sermon is not shaping up to go down in the annals of encouraging things, Father Peter has said, has it? 
I mean, welcome back from vacation, right? <laughs> we had a great vacation, by the way. But there is good news this morning. We can, we can in fact avoid the fate of the rich man in Jesus' parable in Luke chapter 12. We can avoid the total pessimism of the preacher of Ecclesiastes and even the buzzkill of Psalm 49. You see, all is not vanity or a striving after the wind. And there is something to be gained under the sun. But how? How can we, we avoid all this? I mean, it's in the Bible, right? Well, we can die. We can die. And what do I mean by that? <laughs> Look with me now at our New Testament reading this morning from Colossians chapter 3. And I'd like you actually to turn there, if you would. This is page 984 in the Blue Bibles. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. I'm having you turn there because, as I often do, I'm going to grab a verse that's outside our reading. I want you to see it. All right. As we look at Colossians chapter 3, we see Paul, the apostle, painting a picture of the kind of life we are meant to live as Christians. And it's a meaningful life, and, and a joyful life, and a purposeful life. But before we get to that, first and foremost, it is a life grounded in the fact that the price for our life, death, has already been paid for us as Christians by Jesus Christ. And if we are Christians, by definition, we have participated in it. Look at verse 3 here in Colossians chapter 3. And Paul says this before he says anything else we heard this morning. He says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You see that dying part in there? I said it twice just to make sure. You see, we often think that, that life ends in death, and we have great evidence for that. But for us as Christians, a death is where our life actually begins. And no, not, not our physical death. It's, Christianity is not actually some sort of death cult, but a real death nonetheless. Jesus' death for us, and with it, and with it, our death to all those things that lead us away from God. Here Paul again in verse 3 of Colossians 3. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then verse 5. Therefore, because you have died, put to death what is earthly in you. Going forward for us as Christians, living well and preparing for the future, well, it's not about having larger barns to store our stuff in. And it isn't about making a test of pleasure and then being disappointed with everything in the end, with the preacher of Ecclesiastes. And it isn't even somehow to give God the price of our life with the writer of Psalm 49. All that swept away, taken care of, no longer important to us. Because we are in a word through Christ and in Christ, dead to all these vain and meaningless things. Instead, our life's purpose is clear. It is to be who we are now that we have been hidden with Christ in God. To put to death what is earthly, in us. And in case we might have any questions about what that means precisely, well, the Apostle Paul gives us a handy list. Paul loves these lists. He says sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. All these things, Paul says, 
Well, they don't have a place in us after we have died with Christ. They are not part and cannot be part of our eternity with God. So our purpose in life now is to, with God, begin to disentangle ourselves from them. But our life, our life after our death in Christ, it isn't just this negative process of disentangling ourselves from bad things, from dead things, from the old life that cannot be ransomed in the end. Look at verse 10 here in Colossians chapter 3. Paul says, put on the new self. Put on the new self. And then even clearer in verse 12, we get another list. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other. I mean, isn't that a picture of what some deep Christ-touched part of us wants to be anyway? I mean, wouldn't it be beautiful to be kind and compassionate, to be humble and meek, patient and forgiving? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Friends, we spend so much time worrying about the future, seeking security. I know that I do. But you know, usually the stuff we worry about is not actually the stuff that matters most. We worry about the size of our barns and how much we have in them. We worry about whether or not we are having enough fun in life, whether we're getting our fair share. The real things that matter are what Paul points us to here in his letter to Colossae. What matters is who we are in Christ, not what we have stored away. What matters is who we are in Christ, not what we have stored away. So friends, who are you? Who are you this morning? Is your death still somehow in front of you? A blind tragedy, a bill to God you cannot pay, an event that will make a mockery of every barn you have built and any of your plans to relax and to eat and drink and be merry. Or as a Christian, do you recognize that your death is behind you? That you have died with Christ already so that you can live with him now and forever? Friends, our purpose is clear. It's not to gather up all we can in, in fear of the future. It is to take off those things in us that are already dead behaviors and practices and habits that will have no place in the kingdom of God. And it is to put on those things that will define our new life, compassion and kindness, humility and meekness, patience and forgiveness. Friends, if we want to be rich toward God, and we definitely do if we want to avoid the fate of the rich man in Luke 12. This is how we do it. We give him ourselves. We let him begin the process of stripping out what is evil in us and replacing it with what is good. And we receive the benefit. Not of bigger barns and a, and a foolish death anyway but of a life beyond death, shaped by what God loves, and in fellowship with each other through our Savior. Amen.